the plastic bag bag, to the flooding, to the low battery. I speak exclusively with former Charleston City Council member Rodney Williams for a special edition of Quintess Close Ups. And be sure to download the free Quintess Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. And listen to this interview later on the free Quintess Close Ups iHeartRadio podcast. Rodney Williams. What's going on, Clayton? It's been a while. It has been a while. Yeah, sorry it took so long, but finally we got together. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's been a long time. Every I time we call, we're so busy. Yes, indeed. You talk about busy. What is it like to be you, Rodney Williams? It's good. It's it's good to be back in uh, in a private sector for myself. I'm a licensed practice commercial realtor, wow. and I do some merchandise for a company out of Spurna, Georgia called TNG. Mm-hmm. So it's good after 11 by 11 months to have your own time back and put things in perspective and do the things you always do. So it's been good. It's been good to get back to normalcy because it's not normal trying to make a living as well as uh, do, do the business in the city, which I was privileged to have the opportunity to do the extraordinary opportunity that I had. What have you been able to put in perspective these days? Uh, well, one of the things I have been able to put in perspective is uh, you can serve uh, without being the elected official. And I put in the service for me um, being an elected official uh, shaped me, it did not define me. Because what defines me is my love for my city and my love for public service, and my love to serve people. So for me, it shaped me, it did not define me. You talk about 11 years, 11 months that is since being from, you know, obviously Charleston City Council. When you look at council right now, where does your mind go to? Well, I, I don't pay, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to council itself, but I do pay strict attention to the issues of council because I live in the city of Charleston. The city of Charleston, District 2, is my home, is where my quality of life is and which what I'm, I want to protect and look at the city as a whole. Uh, when I look at the city and those issues, I think the city is moving in the right direction in terms of dealing with the, ish, the issues that are really the future, the reality of the city of Charleston, like mobility, like parking, like flooding, like quality of life issue. I think the city is, is situated itself to be in a good position to handle these issues. I think these issues are greater than just the city solving these problems. These are regional problems. These are statewide problems and sometimes even national problems in terms of how we go about funding these fundamental issues of mobility and flooding the city. But I, when I see the issues and what's happening, I think the city is in a good position and the right is in the right posture begin to move to put the connectivity to these issues together because county has to be more involved, the state has to be more involved, the federal government has to be more involved. The issues are larger than what the city capacity is to handle. You talk about mobility, you talk about the future, you talk about county being more involved, and I know that you traverse this particular area all the time, the Glen McConnell Parkway, and I know obviously that's going to be widening in, in the next two, three years. How should that look in your mind? Well, I was at the meeting on Monday the other day. It's critical. I live off of Glen McConnell. Okay. Number one, that is a prime example of a mobility quality of life issue that has to happen. It, had, it, it's, it has to happen today, not tomorrow. Hopefully by 2020 it will get started. When the, when the people who live over there, all we do is drive all the time, drive, park. We have to get a sidewalk from Glen McConnell to Bees Ferry. We have to be able to widen that road in order for mobility to come. Mobility is more than driving. Mobility is walking. Mobility is being able to use other vehicles to get around. That's that we're, We don't have a quality of life over because it's a lack of mobility. When you look at the Harris T, the anchor uh, shopping center that's coming over there, something that I work extremely hard for, that's another issue where we can work, we can, we can come home, we can shop, we can have dinner, but the Glenmore kind County of Parkway is, a, is an issue, is an important issue, and it actually it would help the flooding better because it would flow in a different direction. But for those naysayers who says that we don't need the Glenmore County will only to, to bring more development, that's nonsense. The Devel- development is already there. Now we have to take care of the mobility issue and the safety issue of just walking on a riding a bicycle. So uh, it it has to happen. I'm glad that the county taking the initiative initiative, I think uh, 2020 to start is too long, but we have to have, it's going to happen, and hopefully one of these designs, which I saw the other night, will take place, but it has to happen. It's a mobility issue 
Uh, if not, we'll be in a crisis of how we move around. The development is already here. The development that's pre-approved is going to happen. That's the reality. It's the development is not, not going to happen. It's going to happen. We've got to get prepared for it. This widening will be prepared for it. So see, it's a safety issue. It's a quality of life issue. And you talk about flooding. I've got to take you to FEMA. Uh, this is from LiFiNews.com. The city, uh, city of Charleston Council voted unanimously on Tuesday night to accept a more than 500,000 grant from FEMA. It will be used to buy and demolish free homes from West Ashley that have been subjected to repetitive flood losses. What are those homes in your mind? Well, we've been, we've been dealing with that issue for, for maybe three or four years now, not only just in the, the uh, Tecklenburg administration, but the Raleigh administration. Uh, if you looked at flood mapping back 20 years ago, as compared to the technology of flood mapping today, those homes and apartments, those homes and condos would never have been built. Because there's a different, this is just a different way that the flood mapping is showing where we should and should not build. So now it's, it's time to put that to rest. This money will put that to rest. We will no longer build homes or condominiums where they are built and we can move forward. The flood mapping, the technology today is different than it was 20 years, 25, 30 years ago. So to me, it's time to solve it. It's taken a long, quite a long time to solve it. But finally, we're solving that issue where we will not build. We should not build what we should not build. And the flood mapping today is more technology motivated and it's more accurate than it was before. And if you were to look at that flood map two to three years from now, what would it look like te technologically speaking? Well, one of the things one of the things that the, 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 the flood mapping does not it tells us where we shouldn't where we shouldn't build and and the density that we should build in certain certain areas. But the issue the, the issue in the Church Creek Basin, if that's what we're talking about, yes, sir. if we talk about Church Creek Basin, it's not so it's not so much it's the capacity of how the water flows. You've got to make you've got to mitigate it such that the water flows just differently. The water flows not only around but across the flood up across the, the basin. So new technology uh, mitigating how developers build and, 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 and should not build. We want FEMA and the core engineers to take a greater role in, in that capacity. But if you look at what's happening now, some of the some of the new development in the church around the church community helps the helps the flow of water uh, flow better because most of it flow flows away from the Church Creek Basin instead of toward that way. So with the new study we did two years ago, it's added to the fact of the matter. Well, let, me say, let me say this. We have to be very careful when we talk about flooding in the Church Creek Basin and flooding West Ashley. That's not the only area. Flooding is an issue in all of the city of Charleston. Every area of the city of Charleston has an impact of flooding. That's the way the city is designed. So we have to be very careful in terms of how we model this thing, just like we need the battery, the flooding the battery, we need it West Ashley, we need it James Island, we need downtown. We have to take a holistic approach to how we deal with flooding and the mitigation of flooding and understand that scientifically we are told that we're going to have more flooding and increase of, of flooding. So we have to look at that when we look at it, we need uh, uh, more in the toolbox, we need more uh, innovative ways, like they went to the Netherlands, we right. need to find out those types what's doing on there, and we need funding. We might need $2 billion of how we're going to get those funding sources. We have to look at many different tools of how we bring that thing in. Do we look at the cruise ship taxing? Do we look at more federal money? Do we look at more county money? Do we look at more state money? We need to find a toolbox of resources to deal with flooding for the whole entire issue the water issue is the number one issue in the city, the entire city, not just one part of the city. You talk about the battery. How much more would it cost to fix the lower battery? I don't. I, I think that is a pro, I think five hundred million. I really don't know those numbers, but that has to be. That's the core. That's the core. If we don't do that, we don't have a city. If we don't. If we don't sustain that, the lower battery, we don't have a city. I think the city is moving toward get, doing making that project done. We've got to find the resources. We have to find resources. And you talk about resources, a big topic right now, city council, and they passed just, I believe, the second meeting of it is the plastic bag ban, which will take place really in 2020. How did we get here, Rodney? Well, again, 
you again when you if you were on a sustainability committee which I serve as the vice chair with seekings you do know that there are environmental issues just like offshore Jill there are environmental issues that we have we live on the coast on the coast we have to be uh, we have to be mindful of what we throw in the ocean it, it comes back to us so to me I would have supported the the bag on plastic bag because it's about all over the country people are trying to find ways of how we could conserve in terms of plastic bag it's an issue that just have come to fruition it's a new issue it's a new reality and I think you deal with new realities by new results I think it was a positive as a positive in the right direction it's just like the bike path right. thing. If you're talking about you don't need a bike path, you don't in an urban city, you don't understand what mobility means. It's a total access and providing all types of access to people getting around. And I think the trash bag, plastic bag is one of those things. We have to be proactive and positive about how we treat our environment. What is the state of mobility right now in the city of Charleston, your mind? And my mind is that we gotta go back. And we've got to put a moratorium on hotels. We've got to look at the overlay district and re-figure out where we put hotels, how many hotels we put where. It is a mobility issue. Now when you walk around Charleston, you're looking up, you could fall because everything is so much around you. We need to re we need to redo that. It's time to put a, a moratorium. I voted for the moratorium the first time. It's time to put them need to. We need, we need to bring it all in and look at our overlay district and see what we can do. It's not that it's too many hotels being built. It's the mobility, how we get around, moving around, walking in the city. It's getting difficult. It's really getting difficult. And, and to people who have been here uh, for years and years and years, uh, the city doesn't look the same. And, and part of that is the mobility issue, getting around. We need a hotel. We need a moratorium of hotels. We really do. And you talk about difficulties. Let me talk to you about the hate crime bill that the city just passed. If you were on council right now, Rodney, how would you vote on that? Well, if I was on council, I would, I would, I would vote on a hate on a hate crime bill. I think sometimes uh, the languages that that is used in this country by leadership of this country is language that sends mixed messages. You may, you may not, you may not think that what you're saying matters but to the racist and the bigot and the hate monger that's who they perceive you to be so we have to tone it down we have to tone it down in every aspect i think the city with the hate crime thing with the the the, the um the incident happened at the um, downtown charleston we have to set the example a city the city accepts example we have to set the example that the language we use how we attack people because of their their sexual orientation We've got to set the language, and that was the right tone for the city to set the language that we will not tolerate it. It will not be tolerated in this city uh, to use what you perceive as uh, what your perception is, and, and bring that upon people. It's a good piece of good piece of ordinance. And you talk about ordinances, and obviously city council and city. I got to take you to last night. Obviously, the city of Charleston moved forward according to Live Five News with a new 2019 budget. Council voted to amend the mayor's proposed budget by increasing property taxes by $1.5 million, which would get city employees a salary increase starting on January 1st instead of July 1st. If you were there, what else would you take in as far as the budget and what else would you take out? Well, I think uh, I did four budgets. And when you look at it, it's, it's, the city has a very, very, very small budget for the services that they use. It's, it's very small. I probably would have, I would support it, I would support it, but I would have even increased it farther. I think the maintenance, the maintenance issue of our parks and and, 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 and our parks and our, that, that we have is subpar. And I think I would, I think I would expand that budget to make sure that not only we give the employees increase, which is critically important because we're losing employees to other uh, municipalities because they pay more. And that's important to keep a high level of uh, people working for you. But when you look at our parks and our recreation, when you look at Johns Island, that has not, does not have a recreation facility and the needs, I think I would expand it to cover some more of our maintenance services, and making sure that we get out to the in the areas like Johns Island and build them a first class quality uh, uh, recreation facility. They have none over there. There's none over in Johns Island. 
Rodney Williams. Thank you so much, Tom. I really, really appreciate this. Thank you, man. Thank Have you. Likewise.